following is a conversation with Professor Simon Carding, Group Leader at the Quadrum Institute and Professor of Mucosal Immunology at the University of East Anglia. This is Inside Matters. My name is Dr. James McElroy. I hope you enjoy it. So how did you get into the field of the microbiome? So by training, I was, well, I am, I guess I was a mucosal immunologist. So I was interested in many years looking at the properties of esoteric population of immune cells in the gut. And then I came across... Sorry, for the listener, what is a mucosal okay. immunologist? So a mucosal immunologist is somebody who's interested in the immune system in our mouth, gut, reproductive tracts at the boundary layer of our bodies. So the first line of our immune defense is at mucosal surfaces and the populations of immune cells that live in these tissues in the gut reproductive tract are quite different from those you find in the blood. So their particular design is to combat and deal with infections before they spread through the body. So they have different populations and different functions. And in fact, the biggest population of immune cells in our body is in the gut. It's wow. a huge immune organ. Wow. Is there like a percentage we could put in it or? Uh, it's, I think, 60 to 70% of our wow. immune system is in the gut. Unbelievable. Yeah. And then the lungs have its own unique population of immune cells, the reproductive tract does. But interestingly, all these different sites communicate with each other because the immune cells circulate from one to the other to try and give us global protection at all these body surfaces and entry oh. points. And if there's been an invader in one part, do all the immune cells go, uh-oh, something not right there, and can they migrate and sort of move around, or is it localised to the specific area? No, I mean, the whole purpose of the immune system in these organs is to contain and eradicate. So if there's an alarm bell ringing in the gut and, and there's potential exposure to the same thing in the lungs, you will get cells moving from the gut to the lungs to provide protection at those sites as well. So it's a highly intricate and highly mobile response unit, if you like. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll go back to your career progression in just a second, but there's microorganisms all over and inside your body, right? Yeah. So how does the immune system or the mucosal immune system recognize that they're not baddies? Yeah, so this is what we, immunologists would call it immune tolerance. Microbiologists say it's microbial tolerance. They're two sides of the same coin. <laughs> and so we don't really understand it. But what's interesting, if you look at the lifespan of an individual, you know, we are born sterile. Yes. So there's no way of educating uh, in the womb there in terms of what's good and what's bad. So once you're born, your body gets very rapidly populated with microbes. Hopefully, they're beneficial microbes you acquire from your mother. And as those microbes start to populate all the body surfaces of the infant, the immune system kicks into life. It starts to mature and develop. And it's developing in parallel with your microbiome. And what we believe is happening is there's an education process going on there. So the immune system learns to differentiate and react or not react to the microbes that are colonizing the body. And by about three or four years of age, the immune system is at a state where it can now recognize the microbes that inhabit the body, the microbiome as being harmless and beneficial, so it won't react to them. And yet, if there's an invader coming in, it, ha it has now acquired the ability to respond to it. Right. So we believe a lot of this education process is occurring within the first four to five years of life. Fascinating. So those early life years are just... It is. And critical. so, of course, what we need to do is protect that window of development. And of course, what we know is a lot of children of that age get exposed to lots yeah. of antibiotics, yeah. which can either set back this process or completely throw it off kilter. Wow. And we believe that the chronic exposure to antibiotics is disturbing all this careful balance and that can predispose to diseases later in life. And the sort of example of the paradigm for that is atopic disease, allergies, maybe even asthma. 
And that relates back to the hygiene hypothesis. Uh, hygiene and, hypothesis, yes. Yeah. So, you know, whenever I give public talks about the microbiome, and I always say at the end, you know, let your children play in the dirt, eat dirt, get as yeah. much exposure as yeah. possible to diverse microbes from pets, let them have pets, you know, let them play in the garden, these things. It all helps establish yeah. a healthy microbiome. We, we had someone on uh, the podcast talking, it was Debbie Shawcross talking about how we were too clean during COVID. <laughs> and, and, her concern was that there is this tidal wave of atopy, can I call it that, atopic disease that's coming. Mm. Mm. Because that cleanliness obsession had an impact on our kids during that really, what you're describing as a, just a, a critical period of, yeah. of their lives. Yeah. Right? And that's the problem with these sterilizing agents, you know, the, the hand gels. Yeah. And even things that we antibactericidal that go into our soap powders and soaps, yep. they are having a detriment effect on your normal healthy skin microbiota. And so what it does, it, it wipes them out and leaves spaces for pathogens, viruses in particular, to invade because you're that barrier you've just wiped out with a steri solution. So, you know, it's it's good in one way, right. but a excessive use of these things is in no way I mean, a good thing. This is a Probably quite a controversial question, but should we even be using soap at all? So, I mean, when I was growing, it was all carbolic soap, right? And that seemed to work quite well. But now we have antibacterial cyanide soaps okay. and things, which I think has just gone too far. Too far. We've taken the hygiene too right. far and we're compromising right. our microbiomes and particularly giving us the protection to infection yeah. that we would otherwise have. And what about like... Uh cleaning our food and the pesticides that we use and that kind of thing. Yeah, so, so there are some interesting links to pesticides and toxins in food which are disturbing or interacting with the microbiome. But it's a careful balance because you obviously want to protect the safety of your food. You don't want to be right. exposed with nasty pathogens like salmonella, for example, or Campylobacter. But on the other hand, you know, there are potentially beneficial microbes that are present in mm -hmm. the soil that get into the food, yep. you know, that which can have a beneficial effect on your microbiome. Right. So it's a it's a compromise. It's like in everything, you know, a little bit is is good, but too much right. is is potentially bad. And I guess people might be listening to this going, okay, I need to run around and and roll around in the soil. But even in a teaspoon of soil, there's like as many bacteria as there are stars in our galaxy. So yeah. maybe it's just about. <laughs> Not going too far in the other direction, but not being afraid of a bit of dirt. Yeah, and right? I, th I think it's it's sort of, we're talking about a lifelong, continuous, low level of exposure. It's perfectly fine. You know, drastic change in your lifestyle, <laughs> like immersing yourself in mud baths and things. You know, that's too much too quick. And that can have a bad effect. Yeah. It's just like overwhelming. That, yeah, yeah, but, right. you know, if you're used to, you know, gardening, for example, if you're doing a lot of gardening, then yep. you're, you're getting a lot of exposure to it naturally. Yeah. And that, you know, hopefully is, a, is sort of persisting throughout your life. You know, you're continually exposed to that outdoor environment. I'm just wondering, is there less atopian gardeners? Do we know? Well, there is in children that are raised and born on farms. Uh, than those that live in sort of built urban environments. Wow. And we, again, we relate that to sort of hygiene and cleanliness. And what are we get, not getting exposed to living in, you yeah. know, a city that you would get exposed yeah. to in, you know, the countryside, for yeah. example. But would there not be maybe more bugs in the London underground than on the farm? Some quite nasty ones, I would think. <laughs> Probably yeah. the nasties, yeah. right? Yeah. No, it's interesting because a survey Probably done a few nasties. years ago, of New, New York subway, where they went around taking swabs oh, and things. Goodness. And a lot of them were from you know, fecal contaminants. But also they identified completely unknown really? potential pathogenic organisms living on surfaces in the, in the New York okay. underground. So if you're going to wash your hands, you should do it after the New York yeah. underground. Yeah. Or the I, London underground. Well, you've been on the tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel just dirtier going on the tube. And people probably relate to this. You just feel a bit... Oh. Yeah, I mean, in the line of work we do, you know, you can be end up being paranoia. You think, you know, I yeah. know so much about yeah. what's out there and the potential of it impacting on my health. I don't want to go out. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to continually wash my hands. The yeah. Howard Hughes syndrome, if you like. You know, you isolate yourself in a bubble and you don't allow people in direct so. contact because you're so worried about the potential right. risk of getting exposed to a nasty organism. But that's wrong because you've got your immune system... That's and right. You're probably going to be fine. And right. once you start to sort of 
reduce the exposure your immune system will naturally get to these patterns. It essentially, it's like a muscle. You know, you've got to keep exercising and working it to work effectively. Once you stop, that's when your immune system can potentially become compromised and leave you open to infections. It's the first I'd heard that analogy before, but I really like it. You've got to train it. Absolutely, you've got to train it. So how, how, yeah. uh, actually, let's go back to your journey before I go off on a big tangent about right. training your immune system muscle. But we need to talk about that because I, I love that analogy. So you trained as a mucosal immunologist. Yep. <laughs> I did many years ago, and I was working on these very strange population of immune cells. Um, but then I had the great fortune to come across an individual called John Sebra, who was at the University of Pennsylvania when I was there. And we met at an internal a meeting, and we got talking about uh, my interest, which was gut immunology, his interest, gut microbes. And he said, oh, you, we should come over and start talking. And when one visit when I went to his lab, he said, I've got to show you what's in the basement. Mm. Yeah, what's in the basement? <laughs> and in the basement, he'd built himself a germ-free animal isolator out of bits of plastic tubing he got from <laughs> B&Q, home base. The thing worked. And wow. he kept this, you know, look at it, you think it's just bits of plastic held together with gaffer tape and some <laughs> plumbing coming out of it. But it was incredible. And wow. I thought, well, you know, this is great, John, but what do you think we can do with it? He said, well, I know you work on this mouse model of inflammatory bowel disease, and we know that it develops the disease spontaneously, and it dies very young. What if we remade that, re-derived it, so it was born sterile? What would that what impact on the disease? And I thought, okay. And he, he had the inclination that... He had the inclination the that bugs this, are key. the bugs are key yes. to this cause of inflammatory bowel disease. Yes. So I was a bit sceptical. My PhD was a bit sceptical, but we went through the process of rederiving the mice. It was about six months. Can I just ask, before you say what happened next, what was your perception and your PhD student's perception at the time about the relative importance of the bugs? Well, I think we had an idea there was some interaction that made uh, these animals more susceptible. We always assume it's an immune defect. So, you know, they've got an inherited genetic defect right. and that was messing up their immune system in general so right. irrespective of the stimulus they were always going to behave in this way and it right. didn't matter if it was a microbe or something else so we were more skeptical than john was um, so we did the experiment and lo and behold the mice survived right they were disease free no disease no disease at all they were running what? around just like healthy really well they were completely disease Whoa. symptom free and then we thought, okay, wow. we've got to do the other action. We've wow. got to take them out of this clean bobble and put them yes. in with it. And then they developed they got the disease. It. So that, in my mind, was it. Causality there. That's a, yeah. Take it away, disease-free, put them back, full-blown disease. Uh, and we will certainly talk about the correlation causation. It was a big theme in your There's talk today. a big today thing. At That's... the One Microbiome Health Conference, uh, KTN, so I'm just going to plug it. Um, I was converted after You were converted that. then. I then became a gut microbiologist. Not an immunologist. Well, a little bit, but no, gut microbiology. And how rare is it for causality to be proven in this field? It's very difficult. I mean, it's the big struggle with all human diseases associated with your gut microbes. You know, is it a cause or a consequence? And unless you've got a really good animal model in which mimics a lot of the human physiology, the human disease symptomology... It's very difficult to get at that question. Yes. Um, so it's hard. And there may be inflammatory bowel disease is the disease where we know that the gut microbes are a trigger. We don't know which ones yeah. and how, but that clearly we can demonstrate that. And this highly pioneering work in the sort of uh, cobbled together the homemade, home based, homemade yeah. B&Q yep. lab, which I, I think is just... You've got to take your hat off to... Oh, he was, he was way ahead. He was years he, ahead. He, he, you know. I mean, to have the, yeah, the, the vision. Yeah. So he had an inclination and he went, oh, okay, it's the bugs. Well, how do we create someone with no bugs? I'll just go and build it myself. Yeah. That in itself is amazing. And then the fact that he actually managed to do it. <laughs> that is incredible. It's incredible, it's really. really incredible. Yeah. So when the data start... So I suppose... Take us to the moment where you were looking in and going, they don't, they don't have disease. Well, when they were you looking at your PhD student going, yeah, when the PhD student took me to the animal facility and showed me the mice, said, no, you've mixed them up. 
They're, <laughs> they're the mice that, you know, they're wild type. They, got, they haven't got the gene defect. I said, no, no, they are. So I made a retest that they had the defective gene still. And they did. And they did. And that's when I thought, okay, this is real. Wow. You know? And had anyone done something like that before, to your knowledge? There were people that were starting to move into this area. There was, I mean, in my mind, the godfather of sort of microbiome research, a guy called, um, oh, I can't remember, the name just gone for me now. Savage, Dwayne Savage, okay. in a small university in the Midwest, and he pioneered the characterization of gut microbes. He was the one who was first trying to describe what's there. Really? And wow. this was using classical microbiology tools, so if you can't culture it, it doesn't exist. But he was the first one to come up with a way in which you could start to look at gut microbes. Wow, I've never and heard that name before. Dwayne Savage. Um, and I take it he's he's no, no longer with us. He's, he's no longer okay. with us. Okay. Um, and then there were one, there was a group at the NIH in uh, Washington Bethesda that were trying to do germ-free experiments, but they take and you know let's throw money at it and yep. get a company to build isolators and things. Yep. So wow. uh, it wasn't. It was really pioneering days when John had already you know two or three years late earlier started to try and build this thing and test it and make sure it was Amazing. germ-free. Amazing. So, I just love that so much. So yeah. now if you want germ-free mice, you can go to Taconic or one of the other big animal breeders and they'll charge you a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was that was key. That's a seminal moment yeah. in your, that's a seminal, in your that's seminal moment, yeah. So that flipped your thinking a little bit. And and what, what, what were you thinking? Were you thinking, okay, do I do more in IBD or where else does this go? So IBD was my way in. So with these animal experiments, we could now say, look, We've got clear evidence of a causality. Yeah. We've got microbes in the animal model. We need to start doing something in humans. So then I started working, trying to get samples and work with patients, you know, looking at some of the interventions, you know, what was the imp were there any interventions that impacts on the microbiome that alleviated symptoms in the patients? Mm -hmm. And the one that I came across first was this um, bypass surgery to sort of divert the fecal stream. Yeah away from a piece of the infected gut. Yep. And that caused dramatic relief of symptoms yep. in patients. Uh, so and for then the listeners, some surgical procedures involve literally making a kind of loop and having a, something called a, a stoma, right? Yeah, stoma. So a part of the bowel comes out into the, the sort of outer aspect of your abdomen. And yeah. um, what you're saying, I think, is the downstream part, so basically anywhere below where the stoma comes out is not getting any um, bowel contents. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think I think what you're saying is they don't yeah. have symptoms anymore. No, because you've taken away, you've removed the trigger, the trigger, which is obviously a lot of the gut microbes there. So you've dive, you've sort of saved it from that exposure, and wow. it has a chance to heal. Um, and that's yeah. And was that a by accident finding as well? Well, or? I was just talking to surgeons and then sort of look looking at how they were assessing the patients and right. and then they were telling me about the in some patients get alleviation symptoms with antibiotics which you think okay that's another link um so there were sort of these clues along the way and i thought well this is this is pretty good and that sort of sent me a little bit more down into trying to do human studies um and again sort of bringing in immunology as well into that looking at what impact does all this have on the immune system does it suddenly now get re-educated or rebooted to yeah. learn not to react to um, the gut microbes. And what happens to these patients after the bowel gets reconnected? Do they get symptoms again? They start to get symptoms, get symptoms again. again right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just thinking, imagine if you could retrain just by fasting almost. Because if, yeah. if you fast, then it's kind of similar, isn't it? Like you're not... Well, I mean, if you, if you go with the idea that a mixed thing, your microbiome, you've got some pathobionts, microbes normally yeah. not not going to cause disease, but under some conditions become disease-causing. Yeah, that's so what we define as a patho yeah, pathobiont. Pathobiont. So yeah. if you can get rid of those and replace or replenish with healthy microbes, then yeah. um, that might be a more permanent treatment. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are clinical trials going on now, as you're aware, of using FMT, right. Right. microbiota transplantation, to try and alleviate or treat patients with particularly ulcerative colitis. Yes. Yeah, I'm aware of eight mm. studies in ulcerative colitis now. Yep. And what's fascinating for me 
is they're conducted in different locations. <laughs> There's different routes of administration. Mm. So some are nasal, well, basically I'll call it upper. Mm. Sometimes it's duodenal, sometimes it's jejunal, but we'll call it upper or lower. And we've seen some capsule, we've seen a capsule study now recently as well. And despite all the differences in all the studies, there's a signal in all of them. And I'll define signal as some patients are getting much better. Okay. And uh, for me, you know, the, the clinicians in this space will say it's not ready for prime time yet. It's not, it's not ready because we need, we need more standardization. We need to know how many to give. Mm. And, and I get that. I really do. Because it's not a licensed product and you're taking a risk. But at the same time, I'm thinking, well, hold on a second here. The fact that there are some patients doing so much better and a few do get a flare up, but that seems to be the, ma the minority rather than the majority. Should we not be giving more patients with ulcerative colitis, mm. FMT? So I think you need to turn that around and say, why are those patients not responding, not responding? Yes. Because, you know, we anticipate a successful outcome. Yeah. So why isn't it all patients getting yeah. about it? What is different about those that yep. are not responding. And I, my understanding of ulcerative colitis is it's, it's different clinical subtypes, different symptomology, be it sim severity yes. or qualitative difference in the symptoms. So, yes. so I think we need to marry much better the, FM, the, the intervention to the clinical phenotype because then I think you've got a better chance of having success across yep. all patients with that phenotype. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. And I think the phenotypic characterization needs to be a microbiome profile as well yes. for, really, yeah. for really being futuristic. One of the other things about UC is, is it an inducer of remission or is it some maintenance element or is it both? Do you give a really intensive regime like the Australian study by Param Sothi where they gave like 40 FMTs? Jeez. Yeah. It's a lot. One colonoscopy and then once a week by enema every week for eight weeks, I think, or something like that. I need to get my maths right. I've got my maths wrong. I won't embarrass myself any further on this podcast, but I, in my mind, right. I think it's something like 40 FMTs. And then there was another one recently that combined healthy diet with um, FMT as a maintenance, uh, so maintain remission. And I think both have a place, right? Oh, absolutely, because you know? if you want to sustain your engrafted healthy microbiome, the best way to do that is to feed it yeah. the right thing. Yeah. And that's your diet. Yeah. So when yeah. someone says to you, what do I need to do to make my microbiome better? The first thing that springs your mind is probably diet, right? Yeah. And that's that actually is the first line of treatment for inflammatory bowel disease, isn't it? You start removing things that you think might be a trigger for overactivation of those pathobionts. Yeah. So the first line defense is, okay, let's go to, eventually you end up with an elemental diet, parenteral yeah. enteral nutrition. Yep. And that can be beneficial. If mm. that doesn't work, then you go to antibiotics, steroids, yep. biologics, and then the last resort is surgery. Yeah. So we're starting off actually at the right end. Yeah. Let's try and change it through diet, and yep. or knock out the microbes that we think are responsible. Yeah, yeah. I so, mean, in kids, yeah. it's phenomenally successful for yeah. first first diagnosis. Yep. And I was speaking to someone called Richard Hansen, uh, who was the first guest on this podcast last week, just catching up because he's taking up a new role. And he was saying that actually um, the paradigm's changing a little bit in IBD and they're going in with a immunosuppressant and dietary intervention at the same time. Sledgehammer. Sledgehammer, yeah, to try and really just yeah. knock it on the head. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. But he, he's firmly of the view that you need to combine FMT with dietary manipulation. Yeah, I would agree. I kind of agree with that, I right? I would, yeah, I do. Yeah. If you want to make a lifelong commitment to change your microbiome, yeah. I'm sorry, you're going to, or I'm not sorry actually because you'll feel good, but you have to make a lifelong commitment to change your diet, mm. right? Yeah. Or could you take an FM, could you have an FMT from someone who's made a lifelong Change to their diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the gut, the gut brain axis. Okay, I wondered when you were going to bring it around to that. Yeah. Well, uh, there's, there's something here because yeah. there are good examples, well, some examples of food preferences being influenced by alterations in your microbiome. Um, right. And the one I'm most familiar with is actually chocolate or yes. meat. The smell, the taste, okay. the texture. After an intervention, it changes perception. 
sensory perception of the food you eat. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing. And in a lot of cases, it's, I no longer want to eat that because it smells bad, it tastes bad, and oh. it's just the texture is just yuck. So I'm not going to eat it anymore. Oh. And the, you know, that was part of their staple diet prior to the intervention. The, F the FMT? FMT, um, probiotics, prebiotics, you know, sh things that would really? shift your microbiome. Um, the best example I know is gastric bypass surgery, where these preferences have been documented in patients pre and post bariatric surgery for, for weight loss. Suddenly their food preferences have changed without any conscious effort. It's just, no, I don't like the smell, the taste, really? the texture, and they don't eat them. And meat and some dairy products are on that list. Huh. Can so we, can we talk about the chocolate example just briefly. Chocoholics, it? yeah. The choc <laughs> so yeah, the gums, so they go, they go to eating. <laughs> they, well, it's interesting because there, there's also um, people that, and these are sort of case studies, so it's not by any means yeah. scientific rigorous, yeah. but there are people that really like dark, strong chocolate, you know, 70, 80% cocoa content. Okay. Post, and they used to consume lots of it. Post bariatric surgery, you know, that was just, ooh, too, too bitter. Or now it was just completely unpalatable. What? And they stopped eating it. Oh, uh, and I then there are cases going the other way. So, you know, eating lots of white chocolate and stopping altogether dairy milk chocolate, whatever. They would just stop eating it because it no longer gave them that pleasurable sensation. So, had the treatment interfered with, you know, the gut hormones, serotonin, you know, the pleasure hormone, for it, that would be the. The smoking gun, right? That yeah. you've changed the balance in all these yeah. hormone hormones that influence behavior. Serotonin being the key one because most of the serotonin body is produced in the gut. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So basically, if you love chocolate, could be because your gut microbes are telling you we like it. They like it a lot. Yeah, yeah. We want more, we and want more. and they're producing. Is this us now on subject of bevs? Not yet. No. <laughs> Not yet. But they're producing, the, the listeners will probably like, what are they talking well, about? Well, they're here? influencing the um, balance of hormones. So most of your hormones derive from specialized cells in your gut lining called, it's all part of the enterendocrine system. So there are specialized epithelial cells that line your gut that make hormones and neurotransmitters as well. And we now know that there are populations that got microbes can actually make them as well as the body making them. Really? So there are a lot of bacteria that can produce a neurotransmitter from an amino acid in your diet in a simple one enzymatic step reaction. So it's not complicated biochemistry here. It's one enzyme acting on an amino acid precursor to make serotonin, GABA, histamine. So you can imagine if you've got a lot of bacteria in your gut that can make histamine, yeah. you're likely to be more susceptible to yeah. hyperallergic reactions to certain foods. Huh. So, Is that what causes anaphylaxis, maybe? It can con certainly contribute to it because um, wow. you, know, you can sensitize yourself to an allergen on your skin, and then if you eat it, the reaction is even more violent yeah, yeah. and more rapid because, again, the mucosal cells have gone to the gut and they're primed and ready and you consume it and bang, yeah. you know, anaphylaxis if you're not careful. So can we sensitize or improve people's anaphylaxis through the microbiome somehow? This is new for me. I'm not, uh, this is a new well, uh, conversation. Well, it, it sort of goes beyond describing what's there to what's being produced. What, so I doing? think you'd have to be measuring the content of these things in a stool sample. So the what we call the, the fecal water, yeah. you know, you'd have to isolate the, the liquid phase of your stool and analyze that for these hormones and neurotransmitters. You know, do you have more of one or the other? And getting a sample of the liquid stool must be hard, right? Uh, it's not It's not that difficult. I mean, you just take a stool sample, you put it in a centrifuge, okay. pellet all the hard matter, the solid matter, and you yep. just take the upper liquid phase, filter yeah. to sterilize it, and then off you go. So, so I, I thought it was more like you have to get what becomes the stool in your GI tract rather than isolating the stool? So that's that's good because I'm glad you asked me that because I, the thing that the health warning with all microbiome studies yes. and what we're describing is it's based on a stool sample and we're assuming that that accurately reflects the population's activity that occurs in your gut and that's not true. Mm. So 
you know, we have to be careful. But it's a fact that's often ignored. But it must still be very useful, though, right? Because it's like the end part of all your digestion. Yes, but if you consider where microbes live in your gut, we now know there are different populations in different regions of yes. your gut. And those that are attached to the mucus layer that lines your gut are less likely to be in your stool sample. You're going to be looking at those that live in the lumen of the gut, in suspension of the work. So for the listener then, how do we help them understand all the various microbiomes in their gut? So there's the, there's the luminal microbiome, which is like the space in the middle. And then there's your... So they're the population of microbes that live on top of the mucus barrier. Yep. It's a thick, sterile layer of mucus. It's like a gel-like structure um, that covers the boundary cell, the cells that are the entry point to your body, your gut epithelial cells. And so that's sterile, so it protects from direct contact with gut microbes. But there are microbes that love to feed off the material them. that makes up the mucus, so they will live on that outer layer. Yep. And of course, unless you have diarrhea or food poisoning, you're a lot likely to displace them so well, so much that they'll start to appear in your stool sample. So what you're looking at in your stool sample is the microbes that live in the liquid phase of the lumen are attached to food particles um, yes. that clump around food particles. They will appear in your stool more frequently than sense. those on the mucus. So how do we analyze the bacteria and the mucus? Bio must, biopsies. Biopsy. Colonoscopes tricky. where you can go in. So it's tricky. Sample. You've got to it's physically tricky. scrape off. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You've got to basically pinch off. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And then oh, that's a very specialist. It is. Yeah. So the, the stool is the the best we can do without being very invasive. and. I mean, it's, it's very good, but you just have to bear that caveat in yeah. mind. That you makes know, sense. It's a surrogate. That makes a lot of sense. And of course, within the stool, there's many different things, right? So we've been talking a lot about bacteria. We have indeed. But we should maybe just explore the other domains. Yeah, so this is one of my pet peeves. Uh, <laughs> is when people talk... I'm glad, I'm glad we're on that, yeah. When people talk about the microbiome, it's always about the bacteria. Yes. Or it's like, yes. you know, everything yes. begins and ends with bacteria. Yes. But it's not. No, it's not. It's not. We have gut microbes, you know, they're predominantly viruses. There are equal numbers, if not more, viruses than there are bacterial cells. And then we have fungi, which make up part of your normal microbiome as well. Ancient bacteria, which are a cross between human and microbe, which is called archaea. Yep. And then there are protozoa as well. which are, So it's a complex community of different things. But we just focus on the bacteria yeah. because they're easy to analyze, they're easy to identify. They've got unique signatures so we can identify them and then classify them. Viruses don't have that, so they're harder to describe. Yeah, because that, you know, ha is there any evidence that actually proves that the bacterial element is the most important? Well, I mean, I could say everything that's been published on gut microbiome and health is related to the prokaryon principle. So the beneficial effects that have been described yeah. are associated with the right. gut bacteria. Right. But there are large numbers of viruses that live inside bacteria and can change the behavior of bacteria. So a good question is, are the changes we're seeing in gut bacteria due to the effect of viruses, which are invading, infecting, destroying, yeah. giving them new functionality? Yeah. You know, so are we just looking at the effect of viruses when we're looking at bacteria? Quite, quite possibly. I mean, so it's it's possible. I think part of the context for my 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 question there was, well, as you know, I'm working on the industry side, and I'm leading a company that is of the view that the ecosystem as a whole is more important to look at than any one constituent in most cases. Now, clearly, there's examples that you can give. So, candida infection in someone mm. who's immunocompromised. Yeah which is a fungus for the listener, um, C. difficile, you have overgrowth of one pathogen. But another more complicated diseases, maybe it's an interplay of the prokaryotes and maybe even the eukaryotes as well. And 
where I was going with this is that there's a lot of companies who've decided that it's the bacterial component that's the most important. And we hear a lot about defined consortia and we're going to move to something more defined and characterised, but do we actually know enough at the moment to be able to say, yes, it's going to be a defined cocktail of three or five bacteria? Because the microbiome in all of our patients is so different, right? So why do we not want more shots on goal? And why does it have to be defined? Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's a big oversight um, because it doesn't begin and end all with bacteria. That's that's clear. And, you know, I think there is a slow realisation that we need to look at the integrated microbiome to understand it because, you know, it's it's they're there for a reason, right? I mean, it's not just bacteria there. There are other components. So clearly we've decided they're important to retain. We don't want to get rid of them. Yeah. So they must be doing something. And, you right. know, they've reached an equilibrium with all the bacteria. And so they're, you know, there's mutualism there, there's symbiosis, there's mutual benefit to all of them being present. Yes. Whether or not some are providing food for others, some are providing a protective niche for others. You know, it's a very complex ecosystem. And somebody said to me the other day, you know, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do what's living in our gut. You know, we're just scraping the surface in looking at oh. the bacteria. There's a huge I mean, amount of When you put it like that. that. Yeah. And like we don't know much about the surface of the moon. No, right? we don't. We need to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it's so much still to learn. That's crazy. So I mean, in terms of you know, you is my microbiome it? research done and dusted? Absolutely not. We're at the beginning mm. of this, and it's a long journey before we can say, okay, you know, we can understand. I mean, I covered this in my talk today. We we understand only a fraction of the factors that influence why your microbiome is different from mine. You know, lifestyle and behavior, yes. Okay, medication, yes, we tick them off. But that's less than 20%. So what is the other 80%? And that has to be, you know, the nature of the interaction between all the components. Things we've got no idea, well, the little insight as to what they are. But they are the big determinants of what your microbiome is and what it's doing and how it's keeping you healthy. Sorry, can I just... The 80%... Of the factors are currently unknown. Yeah, so this comes from two very large population based studies in Belgium and the Netherlands, thousands of individuals. Yeah. And they've looked, okay, what factors contribute to differences in the microbiome? And, you know, they ranked these things. And at the top, not surprised, medication. So, and that know, includes antibiotics. Antibiotics, yeah. 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 And then oh, it, there's it, others, right? PPIs there are there others, yeah. And... Yeah. Your blood. You know, the composition of your blood. Your blood type. Factors in, well, not blood type, but it's composition and like blood chemistry. Oh, okay. Then look, obviously, is a lifestyle, where you live, how you live. Farm. Diet, yeah. Yep. Farm, city. Do you live in shared dwellings? Do you have pets? You know, all these things. Fact, do you have children? Uh, cultural differences. You take all of those together and it counts for less than 20% of the variance. So that, that is the rest, you know, is coming from within. <laughs> it's the microbes deciding who's beneficial, who's not, who they need to keep, who they need to get rid of. So it's it's that black box. And does that bring us back to what you were talking about early on in this conversation around the early years being so important? So, yeah. Because that core group probably says, actually, no, you're not allowed in here. Yes, so that's, that's really important. So if we look at... You know, if we look at what we know about how the microbiome changes with age, clearly the young, the first few years of life are critical because it's then building up, it's reaching its yep. um, sort of life, its point at which it's not going to fluctuate much. Should we be doing something during those early years? Absolutely. I would argue if you want to change the microbiome, it should be done in the first three or four years of life. Wow. That is the best intervention. Wow. And... No, it's the things that will promote the development and establishment of healthy microbiome are how you're born, where you're born, and how are you nurtured. So, you know, vaginal delivery, cesarean delivery, hospital, home, breastfed, bottle fed. Those are key factors in the establishment of a healthy microbiome. And, you know, we can enhance that by providing to those individuals who don't get the benefit 
of those beneficial things occurring very own life with the microbes they're missing. And that should be lifelong. You know, if it's done in the right way, right, right number of intervals, right dosing, et cetera, et cetera, right mixtures, you should be protecting people, that individual, lifelong, because they should be stable and carry with them through their life. The, the challenge in, and there's many challenges, sorry, but I think the key one must be, even if you develop this beautiful supplement or drug, proving... <laughs> <laughs> it's a long-term study, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so I, I knock on the doors of investors all the time and yeah. say, hi, I'm James and I've got this great idea. I think it's going to change the world. We've got some good data and uh, here's the trials. And and you know, if I was to go into an investor and say, well, I've got this, this is going to be big, right? Everyone's going to get this if they were born through a C-section or whatever. And there's going to be less allergy, less obesity, less autoimmunity. Da, da, da. But I need you to buy into me doing a 50-year study. Yeah, yeah. They'd all be going, no, no. no we can't do that. Yeah. Most investors want a return in five to 10 years. Mm. 10 years is really pushing it. Mm. Five years is more standard. And there might not be a tangible endpoint. Endpoint. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a benefit to being in a research institute. Where like you have that, like, yeah. like yeah. 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 Uh, uh, where you've got sustained long-term investment, yeah. and the support of you know uh, a stable funder like the BBSC, for example, in our case, yeah. where you can say this is our strategy to do this. We need to undertake these studies, and you know we need your as long as it passes peer review and everything else, they will buy into that to allow us to do that. You need the patient capital. We need the patient capital yeah. exactly. So. Yeah. That's that's one way you can do it. But again, not everybody works in an institute has a benefit of, of that sort of long-term sustainable. And of course, that allows you to retain key skills, people that can do this, highly trained, so you've got confidence you'll be able to get some in product. So what is your research focused on at the moment? And, and if, if I have missed any key part of your journey, let's go back there and let's just explore that before we're talking about the now and we've got lots of difficult questions to touch on as well yeah. still. Like, uh, so when I went back for, to the UK from 2000, I went to Leeds because there was some bacteriologists there who were really interested, a guy called Keith Holland, who worked on acne and right. the bacteria that causes acne. And he was very helpful to me because he worked on a very difficult to culture organism. And I wanted to work on an anaerobic bacteria that grow in the gut. So he... Um, worked with me for several years, well, three or four years, to basically build up the toolkit so that we could start working with difficult to culture microbes in the gut. And then unfortunately he retired and the university and their wisdom decided they were going to hire structural virologists rather than classical bacteriologists. Okay. So that was a time that the Institute of Food Research, as it was then, uh, came knocking on my door and said, would you be interested in developing a gut health program and I knew they had a lot of really good microbiology, basically in the food side, working on lactobacillus, probiotic bacteria, but they're also working with anaerobic bacteria. What they didn't have was more the gut right. side, the humans, the host side, if you like. Right. So when I went down to IFR, we sort of built a program around gut health, and it was microbiology, host health, immunology, et cetera. And that's then evolved into the Quadrum Institute's program since then where we've now got sort of good strength on both the host side and the microbe side. And the micro side is looking at fungi, bacteria, viruses as well. So we've taken the integrated microbiome approach. So that um, really changed the Institute of Food Research into more fundamental gut microbiology, food, gut microbes and health program, which it is now. But I never lost my own personal interest, which is, you know, how does the microbiome work and how does it interact yeah. with us, the host? You know, and it, it's not through direct physical contact, you know, so we're not constantly acquiring microbes from the gut and then processing whatever. Yeah. It's that sterile barrier. So what else can get across that? And so can I just press you on that a little bit? So, so that, the, the sterile barrier. So, and I'll, I'll ask you in the context of FMT, because I'd always thought that in an FMT and for the listener, fecal microbiota transplantation, if you've, 
uh, not heard of it and this is the first time hearing it, go to Buy on Bikes episode number one where I talk about um, intestinal microbiota transfer FMT. So um, I thought that when you instill this, I'll call it ecology, the immune system recognises it as being foreign. But what I think what you're saying is only if it comes into contact with cells that, that are innervated or, or immune cells, right? And it's not, they're not going to because of the mucin. Correct. Huh. Yeah. But so, some of them might find their way. So that's always the danger because, you know, like I said, um, there are people out there that believe all human diseases are related to changes in your gut microbiome. And so how does that work? You've still got to communicate, you know, with the host and drive these nasty responses. So I think the underlying cause is what we call a leaky gut. There yes. are breaches in the barrier. And that barrier is the mucin. The mucin. And the epithelium. Yeah. Or even worse, if you're disrupting the both your epithelium and the mucus at the same time. And this yep. could be through, you know, drugs, medications. Alcohol. Alcohol. Yep. Yeah, these things over a long period of time will make the barrier leaky. Yeah. And that then, depending on what's getting across the leaky barrier, could then trigger all sorts of nasty reactions. And the gut is a massive sensory organ. You know, it's not just got the biggest immune system in the body. It's also, it can also make all, virtually all known neurotransmitters. It's your second brain. It's packed full of neurons, the enteric nervous system. And it's packed full of hormones. So it can so produce when, all these hormones. When people say gut feeling. I get this gut feeling. Absolutely right. Gut instinct. You, you get the butterflies in your stomach. That's all these neurons in your gut firing off. And that could be to say, you know, fight or flight or stop doing what you're doing because this could harm us. Wow. You know, so depending on you stimulate your immune system, your second brain, your hormonal system in yeah. the gut, yeah. you can get different signals going wow. all over the body. Wow. And of course, a lot of them will end up affecting the, the brain and maybe how you behave and respond. So it's a massive sensory organ. This gut brain access then, should we just touch on that briefly? Yeah. So so it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment, isn't it? It is. What does it mean to you? So classically, it's the connectivity between the brain and the gut via a major nerve called the vagus nerve. And that's a bidirectional nerve. So the gut is communicating with the uh, sorry, the brain is communicating with the gut, usually to regular things like peristalsis, motility. And the brain is signaling via that nerve to say, you know, we have a problem, you know, we need to change peristalsis, we need, you know, diarrhea, for example, you know, you get a massive brain causing massive peristalsis and trying to get rid of the toxins. Uh, and it's feeding information to the brain yeah. about what's going on in the gut, basically. So the vagus nerve is there anatomically. So that's a key element. That's a key Direct element. Direct connection. Direct yeah. connection. Yeah. And then you've got the... Uh, other systems, so through the immune system and the vasculature, so if things get across the gut into the bloodstream, they can then circulate around the body, get to the brain, cross the blood-brain barrier, influence the brain activity. Hormones, of course, neurotransmitters, they'll all work through the nervous system, other nerve, nervous routes to influence the brain. And now, of course, it's, well, what's triggering all these reactions to stimulate these pathways? Right. And we now think that a major part of that is your gut microbes, what you have there and how they're interacting with the nerve cells, the hormonal cells, the immune cells to trigger these things. And as I said earlier, we now know that gut microbes can make their own neurotransmitters so they can directly influence the brain if those get into the bloodstream. What triggers them to make them? Do we know? We don't really know. We know that sometimes it's in response to stress. Um, wow. So it's interesting because some stress hormones, for example, acetylcholine, uh, can be utilized as growth substrates for certain types of bacteria in your gut. And interestingly, salmonella is one of them. Huh. So, you know, there are Classic microbes body. which can <laughs> act in response to the, to the hormones we produce. And then in response to various stimuli, like an infection or something, that will cause bacteria to make neurotransmitters or hormones to change this. So there are probably a variety of stresses that can trigger wow. this production. Incredible. So really... It is a fair statement to say, you know, trust your gut, gut feeling, yeah. gut instinct. I'm gutted. Yep. So it holds down yeah, back know, to the not gut. Not far off yeah. the mark there, actually. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. 
Good. So back to your work then. You, we mentioned a little bit about leaky gut. We mentioned <laughs> communication between the microbes and, and, and the body. So how, how are you answering the big questions that you, you described? Like what is it and why is it important? And yeah. That kind of thing. So what are the mediators of normal communication between your gut microbes and, and the body? And like I said, there is this barrier. So we know that it's not intact microbes, which can trigger the reaction. So it has to be small, diffusible molecules like nutrients, hormones, but also extracellular vesicles are part of this. So extracellular vesicles are made by all cells in our body and all our microbes produce them as well. And the ones that we work on bud off from the surface of a particular type of bacteria or category of bacteria called gram-negative bacteria. They bud off the cell wall and they form microvesicles. And these are very small. They're about 100 nanometers. So they're, around, they're approaching the size of a lot of virus particles, for example. So they're very small. And they can permeate through the mucus. And we know that they can then get taken up by the epithelial cells, the barrier epithelial cells. And depending on what's inside the vesicles, they can change the behavior of those cells. And we now know that they can cross that epithelial barrier to access cells beneath them, which are mainly immune cells. A lot of immune cells live below the epithelial layer. And so they can influence the immune system. And they can that can be a good or bad thing, depending on, <coughs> again, what is the cargo they're carrying and, and what type of bacteria they derive from. So... Um, there are a lot of pathogenic gram-negative bacteria, yeah. like Salmonella, for example, is a yep. good one, Enteropathic E. coli, which utilize their vesicles like a Trojan horse. They will put toxins inside their vesicles, <clears throat> and they will, be, they will then be taken up, and they will damage... Ship them out. Uh, the epithelial cells ship them out, causing a breach, which then the parental bacteria wow. can enter through. So that's a pretty clever wow. strategy. So the question is, well, commensal bacteria, the good bacteria, don't want to do that. It's detrimental. So they get acquired through natural <coughs> sampling pathways that epithelial cells use to sample what's in the lumen, decide whether or not it's harmful or not. Yes. So they can utilize that to get inside epithelial cells, cross the epithelial cells, and to interact with immune cells. And so we call these bacterial extracellular vesicles, or BEVs, <laughs> for short. <coughs> and all... Bacteria produce them. Cell, a lot of cells in our body will produce them. They're called exosomes. Yes. Uh, and they circulate around the body. There's a lot of interest in those because they potentially have therapeutic value, particularly as anti-cancer <coughs> treatments. So there's a lot of interest on these extracellular vesicles produced by the cells in our body. But we focus on the, work the on bacteria. <clears throat> Before we get into the technicalities of BEVs, can we try and talk about what a healthy microbiome <laughs> <laughs> You knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. Yeah, it was coming. <laughs> well, a simple answer is, you know, if you're, if you're healthy, then you've got a healthy microbiome. But it's a difficult question to ask because all our microbiomes are unique. Yes. Now, we do know there's a core How microbiome. How unique? Well, there is this argument that we, we can use our microbiomes on microbial fingerprint. Right. And our microbiome can distinguish maybe 90% of us, and it can distinguish identical twins. So genetically identical twins will have a different microbiome. Wow. Wow. So, you know, they're clearly, it's not all us deciding on what microbes will populate our bodies. The microbes are influencing themselves and what else other ones will, will populate our bodies. So, as I said, there is a core, and it's about, we believe, 50 types of bacteria that are present in... 90% of all of us. Not surprisingly, these bacteria provide essential complementary functions. A lot of them are those that produce essential micronutrients, so vitamins, yep. vitamin B12 is a good example. Our bodies can't produce vitamin B12. We rely on the production by our gut microbes or what we require from our diet. Yep. So there's this core which, which allows us basically to digest and process plant-based materials in our diets. Is it fair to say that those core groups must have been on the planet for so long before us? Because if we've all evolved 
to kind of need these core groups. They must have been on the planet as we were evolving, right? Or yeah, it's just this is the chicken egg argument. So which is in, which is the most important? Did the microbiome, you know, help us evolve as to we are? Yeah. Certainly, in terms of our capability and ability to adapt to different food sources, which is the ultimate thing we need, right, to sustain life. Uh, and then we just provide a, a niche for these microbes. So, did they exist in these complex communities before we came along? That's an interesting question. Mm. So these communities probably did exist right. before. So question, where did we acquire them from? Yeah, and right. My belief is that a lot of them are aquatic. They derived. As well as oh, interesting. You know, animal evolution, we moved from the water to the land. Yeah. We and others have identified genes in our gut microbes, which we can track all the way back to aquatic microbes. Oh, wow. From the vents? Uh, no, this is just, uh, just freshwater, seawater. Really? Uh, some live on seaweed, for example. Oh, wow. The Japanese so population uh, in their microbiome, they have a high proportion of a particular enzyme and microbes that produce an enzyme to allow them to digest seaweed in their diet. So really? it's a self wow. fulfilling. So, you know, you want to eat lots of seaweed, you need the microbes lots to process it to get the health benefits. I love seaweed. You don't have the microbes. <laughs> well, you better make sure you've got the right microbes. <laughs> get the maximum benefit. <laughs> and it's the same in our work. So the micro we work with has oh, enzymes, which we can track all the way back to bacteria that live in oceans. So it's an idea, but it's interesting that, you know, these communities may have evolved as we, from yeah. the, the water to the land transition, and they were around at the time we evolved. This is how I you prove this. it, I don't no, know. No, no, we, we need to talk more about this. I love these out of the box. The theories are, it, it would sort of map nicely so onto, interesting you know what we know about human evolution but i just find it so fascinating that this 50 seems to span the whole planet yeah that's just and that is what i think is the healthy your healthy gut microbes that would define health gut microbes. Is it, yeah, what, what order of classification we're we talking about now to get a wee bit technical well genus. no we're, we're getting down to strain level Whoa, you know, as really? With the technology we now have, we can get down to, you know, brothers and sisters of yeah. the same parent. We're down to that level. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah. So there are groups at the quadrum that are very interested in defining strain yeah. level and where do those strains come from? Do they come from our parents, our grandparents? You know, where did we acquire them? How far back can we go? It, it, would, be, it would be fundamentally <laughs> transformational if we could prove that it was this group of 50. Every human on the planet had some, let's just call it 70%, or they had, you know, 30 yeah. out of the 50. Yeah. It doesn't matter what they are, but if you've got this 30, you're going to have the functionality you need. That would be, and the rest is just, I guess they're almost like passengers. They're well, just, oh, no, they're not. You know, it's, no. it's more that, so what the core <laughs> is, it allows you to survive, to be ah, able to survive okay. on the diet that we've, adapted we've evolved to consume so that's right core functionality core survival but not optimal. how well you survive how long you survive yes that's you know all the rest yeah. and that's when you know lifestyle behavior yeah. habit where you live your genome got it comes into I've play so you know the core is there to keep us alive sustain us yeah. but then how well we live how long we live that, I think, is where everything else okay. comes in. Well, let, let, let's jump into that. But before we do that, I, I've got a bit of a confession to make. I think I'm addicted to sushi. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I, I eat so much sushi. And my theory is that there's something in my gut telling me to eat sushi. So I, I don't know. Is it some helminth or something like that? <laughs> No, it, it comes down to cravings and... I get cravings for sushi. Yeah, I mean, some people get cravings for chocolate. I mean, yours I is probably a more no, healthy... No yeah, yeah, it's no, more healthy don't eat, don't eat chocolate. So it's just like, you know, there are signals being delivered to your brain. So, you know, you need to eat this more because it's good for you and it keeps us yeah. there. So it'd be interesting, if you had an FMT, <laughs> would you still have a sushi craving? <laughs> if that FMT donor didn't you know, never sushi. had sushi or didn't like sushi... Would that change your craving? No, but I love sushi. So I can yeah. have an FMT and change it. Oh, okay. Not. Well, you better pick your donor carefully then. Yeah. Well, as you know, we're mixing together microbiomes at Intrabiotics. So maybe they cancel each other out. I don't know. But what you're saying about craving is really interesting. I'll just go, I'll just 
um, quite familiar with the work in liver disease and FMT. And, and there's this researcher called uh, Jazz Bajaj based in um, Virginia. And what he's shown is that alcohol cravings reduce after FMT. And he's shown it pretty convincingly in he- heavy alcohol. Any particular type of alcohol? I mean, beer, spirits, oh, wine? I don't know the answer to that. I think it's, yeah. that's a really good, I mean, alcoholics typically would just drink anything. Yeah. Um, Usually high alcohol spirits. Based on my basically. experience, uh, not as an alcoholic, but working on the alcohol rehabilitation service. Um, and they, yeah, they would drink, they'd have a staple. And, but, you know, it's just about high consumption. But anyways, in this study, they did the FMT and the cravings reduced significantly. Mm. He is a pioneer in the gut, liver, brain access and microbiome modulation and manipulation. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is that these cravings may be microbial driven by the microbes. It's impossible. It's possible. Yeah. Right. Because in alcoholics, so every person that eats a specific type of food, you know, your microbiome is going to adapt to that and realize to survive, we have to use yeah. these as substrates. Yeah, yeah. We have to feed on them. So you'll get shifts in your microbiome to promote the growth of those able to utilize right. whatever it is you're now consuming in vast amounts. So maybe it's adapting for the alcohol. It's adapting. And we, we, I mean, we talked about Harry Flint earlier, and he did some pioneering studies looking at how quickly the microbiome adapted to interventions, dietary changes. You know, and it's within one to two days. You see wow. a shift. Wow. And then, of course, if you revert or go yep. off the diet, again, you get the shift and you can get the rebound effect. You know, And from a weight reduction period, that, that's where some people experience this re- massive weight gain after coming off a diet because you've got this rebound effect in your microbiome. Yeah. And suddenly it's exposed to everything it used to have. It's <laughs> energy dense and it's yeah. busy, you know, depositing lots of excess energy into fat, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah, your microbiome learns. It's a days. smart system. Incredible. It learns to adapt to whatever it has to because it's a survival instinct, if you like. So I guess when someone says, Professor, what do I need to do to change my microbiome and how do I do it quickly? Well, my advice is actually it's the government's advice. You, know, you need to get a minimum of five healthy, five servings a day of fruit and vegetables, the colourful plate. And that actually it might sound trite and well, simple, you know, but it is actually good advice because it contains everything you need to keep your gut microbes healthy. You know? mm-hmm. so, the, so you might say, oh, vegetarians, yeah, they're going to be the healthiest people on the planet. Well, in some ways they are, but they do suffer or can suffer from insufficiencies, yes. vitamin insufficiencies, okay? Because the meat in your diet provides a good source of key micronutrients, which when meat's not in your diet, you need to take supplements. Yep. So a lot of vegetarians suffer from vitamin insufficiency. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I, mean, I love the fact that the government health advice they got it right for once. You They've think. got it right. Got the it government right. health advice is microbiome health advice. Interesting, though, not evidence based. So they knew not at the time that advice got there, nothing about microbiome. Ah, you know, well, there we just, go. This, this brings us back be, to the. This has to be healthy. This know? is it. This is it. People, it, you know, to be fair, if we t- we are at the conference today, we could take. I oh, know it's a microbiome conference. A really bad example. We'll go to Buchanan Street in Glasgow, and we're going to take a hundred people, and we're going to ask them all right. What do you need to do to become healthier? Now, we are in Glasgow and we have very, very bad yeah. public health in Glasgow. Deep fried I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll be optimistic and glass half full. And we said, right, what do we need to do? I bet you they would all say something along the lines of, well, stop drinking so much. If I'm smoking, stop smoking. I need to eat more fruit and vegetables and do some exercise and go outside a little bit more and sleep more. Okay, okay. Right. Right. So how much of that is having an impact on your microbiome? Probably all of it. But the thing that's most impactful is what we're eating. Mm. Yeah. So this health advice is microbiome advice. So maybe the microbiome is, is health. Maybe the key to our health is the microbiome, as we've been discussing for the last <laughs> yeah, hour and it, 10 minutes. It, it is. I think it is. Yeah, it is key to your health. And how... We talk about five. What if we have 10? Well, this is the sad thing. What so about 20? There were surveys have been done to show that as only 20, 25% of the UK population actually getting five servings of fruit and vegetable day. And in fact, there was the been government missions to try and double it. Yeah. So that is clearly it's not a pipe dream. 
because we haven't got enough people just consuming five servings. Um, so, and the other thing, of course, is dietary fiber. So, you know, yes. there are all these recommendations about you need this level of dietary fiber. Yep. And I looked at a survey maybe a year, 18 months ago, and there isn't one country in the world that is reaching the recommended diet intake of dietary fiber. Even you think of the healthy countries, what? you know, there isn't Japan? one country, no. They all fall below their national and the WHO standards. So if we want to we improve world health, you know, there are, there, are, there, are, yeah, there are simple things you can do. Just increase dietary fiber intake, get more people to eat fruit and vegetables. I'm, I'm actually really, I'm equally stunned and perturbed by that incredible fact. Well, I, I didn't believe it either, but it is true. I mean, they, this came from the WHO sources, this information. And yeah, and there's, Lots of countries have set up initiatives to try and get to that level. Goodness gracious. So one question, of course, is, well, what's that level based on? What's the evidence that, you know, yeah. you consume this number of yeah. grams a day? And, you yeah. know, it's a bit flaky. So, you know, what governments may do is say, oh, well, actually, we'll lower them a bit. And then we can say, yeah. We're know, hitting our target. 50% no, do of the population now are doing this. When, you know, a lot of people in the know, it's actually, no, we need to be increasing this even higher. So, you know, the science is going one way and I sense politicians and everything. So what do we do? Subsidise fruit and vegetables for the masses? Oh. Just, can I just plug antibiotics, yeah. please? I just, <laughs> can I just indulge myself a little bit? It's unlimited free fruit and vegetables for everyone at antibiotics. Is it? And that's a fact. Yeah. yeah. And I'm proud to say it. And also the fresh pressed green juice. It's unlimited for everyone. Yeah. Uh, we've got a Vitamix in the office. And, uh, you know... It makes me very happy to say that. Now, I don't know how many people within the company are hitting their fibre intake. No, I mean, we, at, I the, at the Institute, we used to have coffee and biscuits in every meeting. I said, no, 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 we'll have fruit and coffee. Nice. So Nice. And being the Institute of Food Research at the time, you think, well, this is what we should be doing, <laughs> right? True. Yeah. Walk the talk. Okay. But what could we do? What about a wee sachet that contains loads of fibre? Just put it in your coffee. Or is, it that, is that too simplistic? It's too simplistic, and you're missing the benefit of eating the intact the fruit and veg, which has other nutrients in it as well, micronutrients in many cases. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, you distill that down to a powder, you're losing. It's like when you overcook vegetables, you're losing a lot of the beneficial effects of it because you've destroyed them in the cooking process. So eating raw fruit and vegetables is the best way to maximise the health benefits of fruit and vegetables. Should we be washing our vegetables? Good question. I think if you know where they come from, yeah. uh, I mean, supermarkets, you know, are very cautious about yeah. not having contaminated fruit and vegetables on their stores, obviously. Yeah. So there probably isn't. But, you know, in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, a number of people that were wearing gloves to handle things and then going home and washing things and, you know, yeah. wiping their hands were all continuous yeah. with alcohol swabs and things it's too excessive right so i mean you can wipe the surface of fruit but you know to wash it i think that's probably not required makes particularly sense. if you know it's coming from you know one of the big chain supermarkets yeah, that makes sense right let us go back to the healthy microbiome how important is diversity in your opinion yeah so we we, we hear a lot about this you know that the the altered microbiome and disease state is principally due to a loss or reduction in diversity. You know, in a bigger context, you know, we need a diverse ecosystem. We need diversity in plants, animals. So diversity is good, 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 good. Yep. But I would argue in the gut microbiome, you know, if you've got the core microbiome and, you know, your functionality is, you know, you're healthy, you're fit, does it matter if you've got a diverse microbiome? Probably not. Mm. So... Again, it's it's how mm. we translate, you know, all this taxonomic data we get from sequencing to actual phenotype and function. Why is it that across all the case control studies and even prospective longitudinal studies where we look at people as they progress from sick to more sick, we always see the same thing, which is there's a reduction in diversity between disease and control. And as someone gets sicker, they get less diverse. So sicker people will have more medications, their diet, they're probably not okay. eating as well as they could. Okay. Of course, all these things are going to compound. Yeah. And don't forget, every drug you take, your gut microbiome sees it's food. It's something they can process. Every 
oral medication you take. And 80% of our medications are oral, right? Pills, tablets, liquids. Your gut microbiome is another source of food for them. So they will metabolize your drugs. Now that can be good. So like for metronidazole, which is a pro-drug, that has to, for that to work, it has to be processed by your gut microbes to make it effective. But there are other drugs, if they get metabolized in the wrong way, produce toxic factors, or they completely inactivate the drug. So, you know, you may have to give more. And a good example of this is cancer therapeutics, right? There are cancer drugs which work very well if your microbiome is a certain type. If you don't have the right microbiome, then it's not going to work very well. And there are antiviral medications uh, that work in the same way for like uh, treating vaginal viral infections. If your vaginal microbiome is a certain type, the drug will work very well. If it's not, wow. you don't have those key microbes there, it won't work, or it could even be worse. So, you know, everything you consume is going to get processed yeah. by your gut microbes, drugs as well. Yeah. And so it becomes important, you can see this becoming important in terms of treating individuals, not yeah. groups of patients, yeah. to look at their microbiome and say, it will work in yours, but it's not going to work in yours because you've got the wrong type of microbes. So instead, we'll give you this drug. So instead of this, you know, panacea, the same drug, everybody, you're actually now personalizing this, personalized medicine, but it's microbiome based. You know, it's, um, it's so interesting that basically everything you put in your mouth probably has some sort of impact on your microbiome and vice versa. Yeah. yeah. I was out uh, for dinner in January at this medical conference. Uh, it's actually a biotech conference in San Francisco. And the person I was with was like a very traditional drug developer. Um, and uh, he, he said something along the lines of, I've got no idea why people take turmeric and all these oral supplements that have uh, potential impacts on the wider body because like none of it gets absorbed. And I was like, well, hold on a second. <laughs> Doesn't need to be. I was like, you are missing yeah. something so big. It doesn't need to be systemically absorbed because it might be absorbed by your microbes. Yeah. yeah. And then they produce things that are then pushed into the systemic circulation. Yeah. And what I took away from it, what, I mean, it's a super, super smart, successful person. That what I took away from it was, I'm not sure the pharmaceutical industry yet understands that many of their best selling drugs could sell much better if they understood mm. the microbiome that it was going into. So I think it goes deeper than that. So can you tell me which medical school has microbiome science as part of the medical <laughs> curriculum? Well, I went to medical school and guess how much microbiome was on the curriculum? Probably not too None. much. None. None. Yeah. I don't think it's true. So I teach None. medical students at UEA. But, but I think it's changing. Yeah, it's not, I, well, not where I am, because I've continually advocated, you know, we need to educate these medical students educated. about the importance of the microbiome. Oh, we have to. Well, the re so to be honest with you, going back to day one of enterobiotics, 24-hour computer laboratory, running late to select a topic for my dissertation. I was doing a very nerdy form of procrastination, going from medical journal to medical journal. I arrived at the Nature paper from Jeffrey Gordon that showed if you move a, a microbiome from a thin mm -hmm. mouse into an overweight mouse, an overweight mouse into thin mouse, you see weight loss and yeah. weight. And I was just like, what? <laughs> like, what, what, what is that? Yep. What is the microbiome? Mm. You're moving stool and that's causing weight loss? And my mind just basically exploded. And I immediately thought, has anyone ever done that in humans? And then I found the New England Journal of Medicine paper that did FMT for C. difficile. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It's a Dutch group, yeah. yeah. 2013, Van mm -hmm. Nude et al. And, yeah. and, I, and I just thought, oh my goodness. And that's changed the way the NHS practice. So that is an impact of Huge. understanding gut microbes. It's changed the way we treat calcitonin difficile. Huge. And, and, I, and I thought this is going to be really big. Yeah. Why have I not heard about this yet? I was four years in. Mm. <laughs> I was four years into a degree in medicine mm. and I didn't know what the word microbiome was. But And then, of course, that, that, led, that has led to a, a, what will be most probably lifelong fascination and a company. And we're just next week 
dosing the first patient in a phase two clinical trial, touch wood, everything goes to plan, fingers, toes crossed, everything like that. Now, going back to your question about medical schools, this has to be on the curriculum. Mm. How can it not be on the curriculum? I mean, even if you're turning out GPs, you know, GPs need yes. an understanding of this in order to... Everyone does. Pro, you know, develop a diagnosis, it, an accurate diagnosis. Imagine, imagine if... Hypothetical situation. Doctor stands up at a conference and he says, uh, hello, colleagues. Check, check, this is working, yeah. Uh, we found a new physiological system in the body. Uh, and this physiological system uh, probably influences how you feel. It produces every neurotransmitter that we know of, or most of them. It communicates directly with your brain. It interacts with the immune system. It uh, maybe interacts with every single drug that we prescribe orally. It uh, produces vitamins. It, uh, what else could it do? Now we're getting onto the microbiome's functions. Um, provides colonization resistance. Mm -hmm. Produces metabolites that improve the lining and the health of your intestine. Everyone would go, this person's lost the plot. But actually, they're talking about the microbiome. Mm. So when you put it like that, mm. it has to feature on the curriculum. Yeah, it should do. This is this is another physiological system of the utmost importance. Obviously, I'm preaching to the converted, but you know. No, I, I think we're yeah. So, well, I mean, it's the, GM, it the GMC right that decide on what the medical curriculum is. So should we write a letter to them? Uh, I'll co-author. Well, somebody needs to sort of knock on the door and say, "Hey, you know, just what you've said." We yeah. need to be putting this into the curriculum. This is important, yeah. guys. Yeah. Talk to me about colour on your plate. Ah, polyphenols. So the colours that you see in fruit and vegetables are due to a class of chemicals called polyphenols. And these have lots of health benefits, which is why we say, you know, the more colour on your plate, the better it is, because you're getting more of those important chemicals. And... In dark chocolate in particular, they're particularly rich in polyphenols. So if you want chocolate, I would say high cocoa content, you're going to get the benefit of chocolate, yeah. but you're also getting the benefit of the polyphenols, cocoa. What is it about the polyphenols that drives a health benefit? Do they... It's probably a, they're good for your microbiome and other things as well. So they'll get directly absorbed by the body. And there's health benefits to that. Yeah. But they're also huh. part of the keeping your gut microbiota healthy as well because they will be able to utilize them as well. So they utilize them and in return... Health they, benefit is to you as well. They give us some yeah. good stuff. Yeah. And we were talking about nuts as a source of food. And the concern is, you know, I guess, quite high fat, high calorie. But there's something you said about immune system and Brazil nuts. Yeah, so um, one of the nutrients that we know is good for immune system is called selenium and brazil nuts are one of the richest sources of selenium so wow. if you can eat three brazil nuts a day you're getting a good dose of selenium which will help keep your immune system healthy five pieces of fruit and veg three brazil, three brazil nuts. nuts a day yeah. and you're sorted you're on <laughs> your it. way you're on your way good we touched on bevs and we've touched on fmt we have to go a bit deeper on both of those so how how important are BEVs to health, in your opinion? Yeah, so that's still an answered question. Um, I think they're important in maintaining or establishing what we've referred to earlier as microbial tolerance. Yes. So they're an integral part of keeping the immune system educated so that it can distinguish harmful from harmless. So it's a way of continually reminding the immune system not to react and again coming back to john Sebra, he was doing these experiments 25 years ago with an organism called single filamentous bacterium sfb which he could colonize his germ-free mice with and showed that everybody's saying you know the immune system in these animals it's going to ignore them you know it's 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 immune tolerance he actually showed that the immune system does react and recognize it but it's a low-grade, persistent, sub-threshold, the activation immune system. And if you interfere with that by throwing in too much at the wrong time, it will tip the balance towards pathology, disease, okay. and infection warning. 
So, you know, you, it's like you, I mean, the conclusion of what he was doing was that you need this chronic, long-lived stimulation of the immune system just to keep it in check, hmm. to remind it that, you know, you don't react to what's not going to hurt you. That's interesting. But if you mess with that through, you know, a leaky gut and sudden influx or an invasive pathogen too much at the wrong time, then it tips the balance. The immune system says, whoa, whoa, wait, this is bad. And that's when you get collateral damage which we believe is sort of part of the scenario of inflammatory bowel disease. And, and autoimmunity more generally, perhaps, Autoimmunity, right? exactly, yeah. Right, so the, the, the triggers, and potentially the trigger, yeah. is an imbalance between... So the question is, how does your immune system, in what form does the immune system get these messages from the microbiome? And we believe BEVs are an important part of that. How are you elucidating the importance of BEVs? So we rely on a lot of animal studies to do the animal experiments. Then we've got in vitro systems where we can look at individual cell interactions. And in immune cells from all the animals we've looked at from all different parts of the body, the signature response is that BEVs elicit an anti-inflammatory immunoregulatory response from those cells. Oh. And we're talking about the sentinel cells of the immune system. So these would be called dendritic cells, macrophages, and monocytes. These are the cells that trigger the T and B cell responses, you know, the cellular, the antibody responses. So these are the key sentinel cells of the immune system. And the BEVs instruct them to <coughs> generate immunoregulatory responses. The key signature there is interleukin 10. That's the cytokine. Yep. that is our signature for this type of interaction. Also important in IBD, right? Also important yep. in IBD, because okay. if you're deficient in IL-10, then you are more prone to get more severe. So someone listening to this disease. might know someone with IBD or have IBD, and they might be going, right, how do I get more BEVs to produce IL-10? Yeah, so I, I think the first thing is to repair the barrier, because that is clearly a problem in both Crohn's disease, yep. ulcerative colitis, is you have a leaky gut. Yep. And of course, you're not going to repair in the face of a full onslaught from all the microbes in your gut. So you need to be able to allow the barrier to heal. And that means depleting the microbiome, so antibiotics, changing the diet, et cetera, can help yes. with that. And once you've sealed, you then have a chance of restoring that immunoregulatory response. We've seen this in using immune cells from healthy individuals versus inflammatory bowel disease patients. They've lost that IL-10 signature. but we, in, in IBD? In IBD. Yeah. Yep. But if you can keep them in remission long enough, it comes back. So you can restore it. And that's a good indication. Then you've got immune tolerance. You know, your, your, immune, system's re, your immune system's reset. Got it. So it's not no longer autoimmune. It's now... But it can take a long time because anything that happens in that period just kicks you back into... You know, a disease flare-up, for example. And the BEVs are fascinating because they can cross the various different layers, can't they? They're good at crossing barriers. So in animals, we've shown... Do they, they stay can... intact across the mucus layer? And Well, that's, that's the key thing is we, at some point, they have to break open to release their cargo. And we're now trying to find out where that occurs. So in our tracking experiments, they can clearly get around the body as intact. That's it's unbelievable, that, isn't it? A lot of them, of course, will get mopped up and processed and degraded by the epithelial cells and the immune cells in the gut. But some do get across and then go to the liver, they go to the uh, kidneys, and some of them can go to the brain. So we're just trying to identify where exactly wow. and are they still intact when they're reaching these organs. That's what we're looking at right now. How do you do that in humans? Well, in humans, it's very difficult. We would have to use some imaging modalities uh, using the right tag or label for the OMVs, and we'd have to get off the ethical permission to sort of feed individuals with, with these with and then track them through MRI or some imaging modality. And do you know, so for example, does strain X always produce BEV Y and Z, or is it not as simple as that? It's not as simple as that. These are these are we're talking about clever, very clever bacteria here. So they can change what they put. Do you, do into you think it. the bat this is I'm really going off piece there, okay, but just allow me. Do you think bacteria are intelligent? <laughs> if we're defining intelligence based on what we believe human intelligence to be, we say no. But they're clearly adaptable and responsive 
to their environment, which right. humans are, but bacteria do it in a more simplistic way. And they change what they produce to adapt. And usually it's on the basis of survival. So they may change the types of enzymes they make in order to adapt to changing the diet, different foods. You know, they have to produce and to break them down to get their nutrients. And so in BEVs are very good sort of messengers and sensing messages. So they'll, they'll pack, the bacteria will package into the BEVs enzymes, hormones, things that it makes to influence other microbes in the environment, you know, kill off competitors or to promote the growth of microbes that are beneficial to them or to, to impact on the host. Yeah, but how does it know which BEVs to produce? It's just, I just can't get my head around it. So, I mean, I guess the simplest way is that they have sort of sensors and these are encoded in their genome to respond wow. and make the genes in response to a particular nutrient or lack of a nutrient. So they have like on and off switches, which are triggered by a particular nutrient that gets into the cell. Okay. Okay. So right. and depending on which switch is on or off right. will determine what they make or what they don't make and put into their bones. So, I mean, in our study, we show nutrient stress is a big factor that change, causes the bacteria to change what it puts in uh, its bevs. And by that you mean what you give to it? So if we starve them or change the sugar content of the growth media, then that causes the, the bacteria to ch start producing bev. different protein that puts into its bevs. Now, interesting, when you compare the bevs that are made in a culture flask to those that are made in an animal, they're very different. So what it says, the, so the animal, the us, no. us, we in some way can influence the bacteria. Wow. So it, it gets so that's a, more complicated. That's crazy. That so, yeah. so there's other things. So there are other things. <laughs> this is, so we have an influence. Brings me back to the intelligence piece. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Know, I know it's, a, it, it, it's I, I totally, I understand your response, which is, you know, are the bacteria in our gut going, hmm, why am I here? What is the meaning of my existence? Probably not. No, survival. That's the thing. It's all about survival. It's all about reproduction, survival. So they will adapt to change the environment to ensure their yeah. survival. And so some bacteria will spiral it. They'll form spores because the conditions are just not right for their growth. So they'll become dormant spores. So they just say, right, so see they'll you later. So they stay in there. And just then when the right chilling. cues are available, the right nutrients, they're back. They're back. You know? So, They're just so much better than us, aren't they, at survival? So the bacteria we work with, I think, are, are really clever because they can, if we starve them of things, they can feed off the mucus. So they'll feed off us, basically. <laughs> they switch to the their metabolism. disappears and yeah. it becomes a... And of course, if that, like if that goes on for too long, you wear away the mucus barrier and you allow things to get in and then it's a bad case it's a bad scenario because you're contributing to a leaky gut potential. bad scenario for the bugs and us bad for both yeah because the bug if these bugs get into the bloodstream that's really bad it's a and real it can, problem sepsis septic shock and you know that's a very high fatality yeah a lot of people don't actually think about it like that do they is that no. we are just centimeters away well hair you think of a the width of a hair yeah. Width of a human hair, that is essentially so, what we're talking about in terms of a barrier. <laughs> we're a human hair away from sepsis. We're, we're a hair's breath away <laughs> from disaster. Yeah, I, I, that just, it almost makes me happy because <laughs> it makes me happy because it's just so fine tuned. And but that's the way we've evolved. It's just, an, it's incredible. It works. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's incredible that you can be born and, all different parts of the world and you still have a microbiome and you still have a mucus layer and the mucus layer protects you from your microbiome and your microbiome has these key functions, core functions. Yeah. So what happens then if you, I know this is totally unethical now because, and we would never do this, but there must be places on earth that don't have many microbes, like, I don't know, desert or... Well, they're right. They're isolating from these cores, right? They dig in the Arctic, Antarctic. They take what, what I was where I was going with the extreme time, environment. Where I was, and we, we should talk about extreme microbiomes in space. But what if you're human? A human was born. I know they've got their mother's microbiome. They? They the mother is the mother. source of your the microbiome. The, the mothers, the mums are important. They give you all the good bacteria. Because I'm just trying to think in my head. 
could you ever be born in an environment where there's a very low diversity of microbes? And my question to you would be, how do they get the keystone functions if there's only a small number of bugs? But it's just never going to happen, is it? No. I mean, you, you'll always... There's nowhere on earth. I mean, you can't get away from the human host, you know, the mother giving birth. You, you, giving you, birth. You've got, you've got, you have to come into you have, the you being. Have to, you have to be born. And part of that process <laughs> is acquiring <laughs> microbes. Uh, and that's why vaginal birth is the preferred route. Yes. Because you're getting the benefit of your yeah. mother's healthy microbiome. Okay. Uh, do you think there's microbes in space? I don't see why not. Yeah. No. I mean, it's life on another planet, right? If we look at it, life forms like us, well, not probably as us. No. So, you know, there probably is. We just single celled organisms. Don't know how to describe it or okay. identify it yet. Yeah. 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 Carbon based. Yeah. I mean, it, going back, it's, I mean, the, the Big Bang, right? There were, one idea is there were microbes on that initial impact the big, that led to, you know, the impacts of Earth with comets and meteorites and things that carried with them. So the our, our that, Earth microbiome was seeded by some other microbiome elsewhere. Yeah, I like it. Well, it had to come from somewhere, right? It had to come from somewhere. Why not? Why, Why not? not? Why not? Wow, there, there might be even more crazy microbes not too far away from us. No. Aren't there... It's that part of the expedition to yes. Mars is to look for yes. these ancient. Yes, yes. Microbes. I mean, I've been doing a lot of reading recently on lichens mm. as a model of symbiosis. And well, these are kind of crazy. Lichens are just a microbiome, essentially. But as part of that, I've been reading about the extreme microbiome projects. Uh, and what they're doing is sampling microbiomes in extreme parts of this planet. Mm. So the vents, vents yeah. and the Arctic. Mm. And seeing if there's bugs there. And if so, what are they like? And uh, that's important because, uh, well, t two reasons really. Uh, one, if we're sending people out there to these extreme, well, these, these other planets, we need to know really kind of what we might be contending with. And the other element as well is, well, what are we bringing back mm. into our ecosystems? And how damaging is that going to be for us? You know? yeah. um, so that's fascinating. It's worth checking out if you're interested. Well, I think there's viruses, isn't it? Because they can live outside of a host for forever, a long, long time. So I think if it's something like that is going to come, it's, it's a virus. probably going to be a virus. I don't fancy that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about your work in FMT, your experience in FMT, your, your plans. So we've been working on FMT for a while and we've been looking at the context of ageing. So, aging. Aging. So your microbiome deteriorates with age. We know that. Even it, looking at it gets less diverse. It gets, it gets less diverse. Yeah. So and and that is coincident with physiological decline. And in particular, look at your immune system. Right. It goes into senescence with old age. So we become immunosenescent, which means the immune response doesn't respond very well to vaccines. We're more susceptible to infections and we can get predisposed to certain types of cancers because we've lost that immune surveillance, protection, robustness. So the question is, you know, is this linked to the deterioration change in your microbiome with aging? And of course we've got all the cognitive deficits as well with aging. We start to lose, you know, our eyesight fails with age, all these bodily functions fail. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, a couple of years ago, we started looking at this, thinking, well, what if we took a uh, really old mouse? So two years of age, which equates to around about 70, 80 years in humans. And we take a young mouse, an adult, teenager in human years. We gave, we took the microbiota from the young mouse, we put it into an old mouse. What, what effect does it have? Well, quite a lot, as it wow. turned out. Okay. okay. So what we saw was that we lost a lot of this, what's called inflammaging. So a lot of the deterioration <laughs> with our bodily functions due to this chronic inflammation that happens in later life. So with the young microbiota, we were essentially able to dampen that down. And actually we reduced inflammation in the brain, <clears throat> the immune system sort of kicked up a little bit. And interestingly, the eye, we now see much more functionality in the retina. After the FMT. After the FMT. So the FMT reversed some of the hallmarks of aging. Aging. And of course, we, so we did the opposite. Wow. We took an old wow. microbiota, put into a young mouse, and we saw signs of aging, accelerated aging in the young mouse. So <laughs> oh, it's, you know, hey. Here we go, guys. Here we go.
We've got it. And it's interesting because the, the media picked up on this, of course, and we even had a nice uh, comment from Kim Kardashian. What? Yeah. <laughs> give me, give me, give me a shit sandwich every day. I'm happy. That, this it, thing it, keeps it, me longer. Is that what longer. Kim Kardashian said? Does Kim Kardashian want a FMT? Yes, Does that was her response. Available? Somebody had talked about this. Said, "Yeah, I'm up for it. Give me, you know, the milkshake or the sandwich, and uh, I'll take wow. it." Wow! Wow! Well, soon so it's be able had to an get effect. So, of course, the kick is what is in it? What is in a young microbiota that is not in an old that can have these effects? So, can I uh, ask one question? Sorry, the microbiota. You're talking about the whole ecology, the full whole. ecosystem, not just the bacteria. It's a stool, stool stamp all stool, that's yep. Yep. homogenized and then administered. Yep. Were you expecting that result? No, not really. No. Well, we were looking at the immune system. We thought, well, this is a good chance because. I submitted a grant to the NIHR three years ago to do an FMT in elderly individuals to boost their immune response to influenza vaccine, the annual influenza vaccine. Okay. And they said, well, you know, you, you can't do this. What's the evidence that giving an FMT to otherwise healthy individuals is, is not going to yeah. have adverse effect? Yeah. So that didn't go anywhere. So we had to sort of go back and work on our animal models. Can I just say, if you would like to do a study on aging, I mean, my, my main interest outside of antibiotics is kind of aging. I'm also interested in lichens and plants and plant-based medicine. And sushi. And I love sushi as well. <laughs> I really like sushi. <laughs> but I have been saying for a while, look at the diversity in these prospective longitudinal studies in patients who are older and look at how it compares to mm. earlier in life. Yep. Yep. Vastly reduced diversity. I think Paul O'Toole's done a lot of work on this. That they, key species missing as well. Key, key some species missing as well, right? In the elderly. And um, that could be because their diets change. It could be because they're in a care home. It could be because of concomitant medication. It could be because they've got underlying disease. But, but if we just assume for one second... <laughs> that it might be to do with aging. Why don't we do an interventional study in humans? Are we expecting to see a negative impact of increasing microbiome diversity? Well, I think it's because the attitudes are hopefully have shifted and changed since I submitted that grant. Yeah. And, you know, we do, we've done the experiments in mice. We're going to do in a similar experiment in a primate model. On the back of that, and we've got an FMT lined up for... ME CFS, which have definitely need to talk about that. Yep. Uh, so with that, I'm thinking now the NIH cannot say you know you haven't done enough work in animal models, preclinical models, or human because we will have done by then. And I'm going to go back in and say, look, with the pandemic, yeah, influenza epidemic, potentially yeah. a pandemic, why wouldn't you want to protect the vulnerable with a simple procedure? And by the time we get to that, I'm hoping we'll have a We'll have identified what the active ingredients and the missing bugs are, so we can just give a defined mixture. Of bacteria. Of bacteria. Well, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not, because in our mouse model, we've shown some beneficial effects in just transferring fecal water rather than the whole stool. And, of course, fecal water contains yep. viruses, yep. BEVs, metabolites, yep. other nutrients. So... Clearly, maybe you don't need the bugs. You just need what they produce. Should we talk about that then? Because some, some people talk about this sterile fecal filtrate. Sterile means no bacteria, right? Yeah, but it doesn't mean there aren't viruses, which There's are definitely not viruses, sterile. Right? Yeah. There's definitely yeah. viruses. Because yeah. Yeah. there was an, a study in C. diff where they gave this, what they called sterile fecal filtrate. They did a pressure filtration mm. and they gave it to like three or five patients and they had a positive result. Yeah. Yeah. And the hypothesis was actually, do you need the bacteria at all? Or do you just need their products of metabolism? But well, well it, so if it, if that's interpreted as an effect due to metabolites, that's going to have a short-lived effect when you transfer them. So you, that's the benefit right. of giving this whole stool is, that is you've got the producers there. Yeah, you've got the factories. So, yeah, it persists. Yeah. yeah, viruses again. You say, well, eventually they'll decline because if they'll disappear. Not, they'll disappear. So, I guess it depends. You know, you can pick a scenario and a treatment for a particular case. And you're right, maybe you don't need a whole stool, you can give sterile filtrate. Yeah. Or yeah. a virus cocktail, or BEVs, or metabolites. Yeah, and yeah. maybe it depends on the indication. Yeah. Uh, can I just ask you about the ME work then? And also, what's your vision for FMT and longevity? Do you think we might be... I mean, Kim, Kim Kardashian to one side. Um, uh. 
because people have for a while now done these um they've tried to have blood transfusions from younger people there's companies that have tried to yeah, do this yeah, right yeah. You've probably heard of it <laughs> and if you've got enough money you can kind of in this day and age try anything yeah sure. um so i'm surprised that there's not more of a demand for but let me put it this way don't you think it makes perfect sense because we've been talking now about the microbiome being essential for health if that gets messed up it maybe it's not surprising we are going to get sick and aging if you look at it consequently of a disease then the implication of that is treatable and where would you want to start the treatment aging is a disease yeah is it is it a disease i think it could be a disease yeah so i think it could be microbiome a essential for this we know it deteriorates in peril with aging so you know if we change the microbiome could we at least slow the progression you know benefit is we stop it but anyway let's we can slow that trajectory and that has a big impact on whether or not you develop neurodegenerative diseases in old age we haven't talked about parkinson and alzheimer's which we're interested in as well so you know you could put the brakes oh. on not just declining health in old age keeping people fitter and more active for longer could have an impact on these really severe debilitating dementias and you know my work on me is related because they have significant cognitive deficits gi issues for the listener fatigue. can we just um provide a little bit of background on so we're talking about myalgic encephalomyelitis the common name is chronic fatigue syndrome for which there's no cure there's no effective treatment and the number of patients is really underestimated because it can take patients years to get a diagnosis um, and there is i think a bit of a ticking time bomb here because with long covid i suspect significant proportion of those patients will develop me so the numbers of affected patients are only going to get better and so few of them make a full recovery and the more severe forms patients are bed bound house bound incredible sensitivity to light sound so these people are in desperate That's need terrible. of new treatments and terrible. we're fortunate in working with a charity called invest in me research which is funding research at the quadram to develop a center of excellence for me they've supported with the university phd studentships they're funding an fmt trial in me which will hopefully happen later this year so we're looking at trying new interventions but not trying to uncover what the cause root cause of me are and develop new interventions to treat me your thinking is that if you instill a healthy ecosystem you drive processes in a different direction to what might be contributing to the disease yeah, yeah. so the disease has long associated with virus infections and first it was first thought to be a variant of polio really infection that's the history that's fascinating uh, it goes all the way back to sort of oh this is just another form of polio but also it gives you some indication as to how terrible <coughs> this is absolutely yeah if that's what in the early days people were thinking right that's how bad it is yeah, yeah. so for the, so for the really severe cases that can, can patients actually leave home no they can't even leave their bed wow yeah. and it's a darkened room they're sensitive to light and sound so just the touch touching their skin I mean, we've seen some of these patients that we tried to recruit them to some of our studies. And, you know, it's just a horrible, horrible existence. That's just, that's just really, really bad. And there's nothing available. No. So they were originally described in outbreaks yeah. in places like Iceland, America, in the UK. Mm. <coughs> but the exact trigger's not been identified. They've been linked to herpes virus, Epstein-Barr okay. virus, polio virus, as they yeah. said. Yeah. So we believe that viruses are in probably a trigger, but in fact, they're not acquired they could be from what's normally part of your virome <coughs> that makes up your gut microbiome some patients they get a bloom or an outbreak of these viruses which can trigger symptoms of me and if it's not treated the virus is eliminated it's a chronic exposure so we believe that treating the microbiome might be an effective means of treating me an fmt is probably the more radical right. approach right you know it will replace what's there with a healthy microbiome yes. So the FMT trial we're proposing to do is is important, and it's based on case studies carried out in Australia, where a particular individuals have been using FMT to treat his patients very successfully, apparently. So we're going to want to take a clinical trial, placebo controlled, gold standard, randomised, the gold standard, yeah, yep. and this will say FMT could be safe 
an effective treatment for ME, which should be huge transformational. for patients. Transformational huge. for patients. Huge. And have you found that there's been uh, already quite significant patient demand? Yes. So they've, we they've probably, my, my experience, I mean, you're describing something which is just, I can't even imagine. I can't actually imagine it because I'm so active and love being outside. But, you know, in my experience, patients do a lot of research. So they probably have read the case reports that you're talking about and want to find an FMT. Yes. Right. So I, I gave an interview on BBC4 Radio Today programme two weeks ago. And I must have had 70, 80 emails from patients desperate to sign up. Um, I believe it. I believe it. Uh, and believe it's, it. they're still coming in. I looked at my email today and I've got half a dozen patients wanting to know more about oh, signing up for the we, trial. We, we, need to, we need to help these people. Absolutely. We need to help these so people. The, so we're fortunate in the part of the country where we are that there is the chronic fatigue facility uh, centre based in Lowestoft where they have a lot, they treat a large number of patients. So they will be our recruiting centre. Yeah. And they have over a thousand patients registered with them and they already have over 200 patients on the waiting list for the trial. So you know, I don't think recruitment is going to be an issue for us. There are patients desperate. Yeah, I, I believe it. Desperate. Well, all the very best with all of that. Thank um, you. I'm really excited, actually, to see what happens. We, I've been talking for a while, but I would love to talk about Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, if we can, sure. um, and what the links may or may not be there and what the future might be for these patients. And then let's talk about the future more generally. Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you about probiotics and prebiotics. <laughs> you must all the time get people saying, Prof, which probiotics should I take? And my answer is don't waste your money. Eat more fruit and vegetables. Yeah. Feed your gut microbiota. Yes. Because, you know, what you consume in a little yogurt pot is literally a drop in the ocean. You know, which is fine if you're selling it, because then you have to eat every day, every day, every day mm. to get that. But far more effective is to feed your gut microbiota. Give them what keeps them strong, healthy, and you healthy. Okay. So... Spend your money on fruit and vegetables. Get your five a day. Get your five a day. Don't spend sixty pounds, seventy pounds, whatever it is. No. Spend it on the best food you can spend afford. Spend it on the best. I'm really pleased, Professor, because that's what I say to people as well. So I'm I'm very happy. I'm singing from the same <laughs> hymn sheet as you. <laughs> good. Yeah. Yeah. You are what you eat, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly. Good. good. So now to uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So, what what's what's the thinking there? You know, everybody knows somebody with... It's, it's interesting. Yeah. And I think the microbiome is sort of coming a bit more front and centre in terms of a possible causal link here. Um, so with Parkinson's disease, again, a lot of patients report GI issues prior to onset of symptomology. Dopamine, the key yep. hormone, the neurotransmitter, yep. over 60, 50 to 6% of that is made in the gut. So, you know, if you have a dopamine deficiency in your gut, that's probably going to impact on the overall huge. balance. It's huge. And that could be important as well. <clears throat> and, and there are sort of studies built in animal models which seem to link severity and onset uh, to the types of microbes. And you can alleviate some of that by manipulating the microbiota. Right. So there is a keen interest in this. And I think studies in patients have shown that microbiota is clearly different to a normal healthy individual. So there is, I think, reasonable grounds on which to say, okay, if we can intervene more wholesale early, so pick up the first symptoms and then give a wholesale replacement of their microbiota, we might have a better chance of just sort of kicking it around the edges with probiotics, right. antibiotics, yeah. <coughs> et cetera. So FMT might be beneficial in those individuals. Alzheimer's disease, again, a lot of the evidence is based on animal models. Um, but it's interesting because there's evidence that some bacteria can produce things that mimic the fibers that trigger some of the pathology seen in Alzheimer's patients. And there's some believe that if you've got these bacteria and you've got producing these fibers, they can get into the vagus nerve, get into the brain. This then seeds 
Whoa. the development of these platforming yeah. that we have. And got, so wow. that's, that's one line of thinking. The other, of course, is, well, it's due to what the other things that the gut microbes are producing, you know, and it's tipping the balance in neurotransmitters, et cetera, et cetera. So there could be a direct causal link there through microbes producing things that mimic uh, some of the, these pathogenic proteins that are found in the brains. And this then just exacerbates the inflammation and progresses the disease. Wow. So again, the argument there is, you know, if we wholesale replace what's there with a healthy microbiome, yep. maybe we can stop that, slow it down. Yep. So the quadram on the back of, you know, what a trial that we want to do, an FMT trial quite soon is in Parkinson's, and particularly early onset, and working with the hospital, the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital, there are consultants there who have identified what could be protect, prospective candidates for the trial. Early onset, relatively young people, so if there is a beneficial fact, have a major impact on the rest of their lives. So that's what's sort of in the pipeline, as it were. That's very exciting. Very, very exciting. I think yeah. everyone listening will know somebody who's been affected uh, or, you know, have had first-hand experience of how horrific they are in these two neurodegenerative diseases. Absolutely, yeah. It's just devastating. So what does the future look like then for this field, in, in your opinion? And, and you know, if, if we had this conversation again in 10 years, 20 years. Yeah. So I, I think the future is prevention. Yeah. So we're getting very good at cataloging the microbiome and clearly, you know, to increasing powers of resolution. So what I would hope is that we're moving towards personalized medicine in the future. <clears throat> and then when you go to see your GP, you'll take a stool sample. The GP will have the equipment, to tests, whatever, to be able to immediately analyze your stool sample and say, hmm, missing this, missing that, ooh, too much of that. Mm. This is bad because this could potentially put you at risk for developing cancer, IBD, right. Right. rheumatoid arthritis. Right. So we need to do something now about that. So depending on what's missing or what's being overproduced, you know, the doctor will be able to come up with, this is what I'm prescribing. You know, it could be a defined cocktail capsules. It could be changing your diet. It could be phage therapy, okay? So the beauty of using bacteriophages is they're exquisite in terms of what they target. They target just specific bacteria that have the receptors they allow them to bind and then kill the bacteria. So antibiotics are a shotgun. Phage are like a sniper rifle. They can home in on the bad guys and leave everything untouched. What level of specificity? <coughs> Strain level. Strain level. Perfect. So, you know, it could be a phage. We're going to give you these phage cocktail that you take. We're going to knock out the bad guys. We're going to change your diet to boost the levels of the good guys. And, you know, we'll give you these BEVs because they've got all these nice things in there that will trigger the right sort of mm. hormone release in your body. Mm. Mm. Or we'll give you this cocktail of bugs which you're missing supplement. So the GP will have an array, an Toolkit. armory Toolkit, yeah. of tools yeah. to be able to decide what's going to work for you. Yep. Personalised medicine. And everyone's going to have their five a day. And everyone. So the important, yeah, exactly. So the important thing with all of these treatments is you've got to... Yeah. <coughs> Enhance, you've got to promote them, you've got to keep them alive, you've got to keep them going. So that comes into your diet and your lifestyle, okay? Yes. You've got to live healthy as well as eat healthy. So what, what do we do in our FMT studies then? Do we, do we give, I say we, I'm asking you, but I'm also asking myself, are we asking them to eat a particular diet after? Well, we do. I mean, the hospital does when yeah. where patients come in for C. difficile treatment by FMT. They're given some advice. Post about what to eat. Yeah, yeah stream. That makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> and obviously it's things to avoid. And then you try and get them to eat more healthily. So you try and sort of eliminate the things that will knock out your beneficial microbes. And, you know, we had a bad incident in one case. Uh, it was an alcoholic who came in for a recalcitrant C. difficile, was given FMT, and they said, look, you're going to have to stop consuming so much alcohol. This could impact on your FMT. Yeah. Unfortunately, they couldn't do it. And the FMT was useless. Didn't work. Didn't work in that individual. Because they were drinking so much. Because they had gone back to the lifestyle that in some, probably contributed to uh, the infection in the first place. 
Do we give them another FMT or? Well, that's the moral dilemma, isn't it? Do you, you keep know, doing it? Yeah. Do you keep doing it if the if they're not going to change their yeah. lifestyle? Didn't change their cravings. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the same argument with smoking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I hear you. You know, it's a personal choice. Yeah. But society bears the brunt yep. of that choice. Uh, absolutely. No, hundred yeah. percent. Professor, uh, we're at uh, two hours, believe it or not. So three hours. Two hours. Two hours. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, it does yeah, indeed. So, just wanted to thank you for coming on. Well, thank you, James. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, yeah, it really has been a pleasure. It's super, super insightful and interesting couple of hours. And uh, wish you all the best with your research. And thank look you. forward to staying in touch and maybe collaborating. That would be great. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Cheers. Cheers.